Good morning, Christian, and uh, welcome to Kaizen Commune podcast, Who Has a Clue, where we talk to people who indeed do have a clue, such as yourself. And today, the topic at hand is engineering excellence and empowered teams. So we know that this word has been around for quite some time now, empowered teams. And I think the maturity or the journey to the maturity is all about bringing the team together because all the keywords that we have heard and learned and practiced so far, the collaboration aspect of it, the velocity aspect of it, um, having to have better communication, honesty and courage and bringing all the agile values into engineering practices. And that is the topic at hand today. Before we begin, Christian, would you like to say something about the topic and a little bit about yourself maybe? Yeah, um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to your podcast. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, yeah, about myself, um, I'm um, in this sweet spot at the end of the Generation X that some people call the home computer generation. Yeah, yeah by, by people who are uninformed about that, they believe we are not digital natives, but we are not just the digital natives, we are the ones who created that world. Yeah. Correct. So, um, started programming at the age of eight in 1984 on an Amstrad CPC 464, an 8-bit home computer. If you look at the specs, 2 megahertz, 8-bit Zilog Z80A CPU, 64 kilobytes of RAM. You couldn't even use all of it, 16 <laughs> kilobytes with the video RAM. Um, we've come a long way in, in the specs. Yeah, you, Not just your phone, your wristwatch is probably more powerful yes. if you have one, <laughs> if you still have one. True, true. So, so yeah, I mean, like I was talking to you earlier about this topic, while the focus of the entire industry is now about shipping software, doing rapid development, uh, being quick. So I recently read your post about defining what quick is, which is how different it is from hurrying or haste. Um, and uh, while we focus on delivery excellence, um, we need to have enough cognizance on engineering excellence also. So we build quality ground up and that is what is the topic going to be uh, today at hand um i i am going to insert a comic strip from dilbert here which talks about every employee um so the boss comes and tell his tells his subordinates that every employee is going to wear a badge saying i am empowered and the employee retorts saying no i don't want to and the boss says you have to and uh, and yeah, and the colleague, one of the colleagues just tells him that was just life in a nutshell for you. And that's everything you needed to know. So being empowered uh, is actually not a designation. You can't really tell people that you are empowered and now they start feeling empowered about it. Uh, if you had to define what empowered truly means, how would you go about it? Um. I, th I think it means a feeling of unrestrictedness in order to achieve your goals. Mm -hmm. And it, it means we can't be empowered about everything yeah? because not all of our goals are always achievable. Yeah? We, it um, requires alignment with other people. Yeah? Goals of different people might be conflicting. Yeah? Um, and that, that's okay. There's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that. that that's life. Yeah? You have to find compromises. Yeah? In, in terms of compromising, I feel empowered means that you're able to negotiate your compromise. Yeah. Yeah? For example, if you're, you're talking with, with your boss about a, a problem and you don't feel that you go out of the meeting with a compromise, but you feel you go out of the meeting with um, the boss having bulldozed over you with their opinion, um, <laughs> you probably do not feel very empowered in that very moment. Right. Um, empowerment, I think, is related to, not the same thing, but related to motivation, uh, which means that while we say we have to empower teams, um, I agree with... Um, that the spirit of that strip, yeah, in, in more than one way, one is you cannot um, bestow empowerment upon a group <laughs> of people just like that. It's not a knighthood, right? I mean, it's like exactly, yeah, yeah. 
it also has to come intrinsically from the people. And we have to accept that not maybe everyone wants to be empowered because with power comes responsibility. Okay. And not everyone is um, ready to take on every possible responsibility thrown at them. And that's okay. It's part of life to say not only yes, but no to everything. And just statistically, if we if we oversimplify this a little bit, if you want to be a content average human, you probably should say no as much as you say yes. 50 right. 50. That if you if you may do the statistics, yeah. Right. And um I mean we we can um move to a higher percentage of yes if we are ready to compromise in negotiations. That's what negotiating is about to get a yes out of both parties without a yes being a loss for any of the parties. Yeah, I think that's a fundamental aspect of negotiation. Yeah? But um, I find part of this culture that says people should be empowered and um, so on, I find it um, at the risk of bordering to positive toxin, uh, how do you call it? Positive toxicity. toxicity. Positive toxicity, yes. Yes. Um, and what if someone just wants to do a nine to five job, um, get their paycheck and just do work? Yeah. Oh, you're what's you're, you're... wrong with that? Yes, when, absolutely. When I that, agree with it. That become wrong. Yeah? Yes, I, I mean, agree with it. I'm I'm not that person, yeah, which is probably why I'm on that podcast, but I want to speak for the people that are like that. You are okay. There is nothing wrong with you. Exactly. You're totally fine. Yes. Yeah? I love that. I uh, So there were so many interesting things that you just, so I'm just going to summarize what you said really quickly and you can add on to it. Uh, so you were, you started talking about goals. You started talking about alignment within the team. You're talking about ridding off you any inhibitions. So you are unrestricted and you feel, so the sense of empowerment comes from your ability to speak freely, to do things freely. Yes. And that does bring me to one of the points which I read in one of the books that it's easier to seek forgiveness than to ask for permission. And uh, that actually kind of states empowerment in the sense that you feel empowered enough to go ahead and do it. And you also own the consequences of it. So you fix things. You also ended oh, yes. that paragraph with saying that not everybody wants to be empowered because uh, with great power comes great responsibility. And it's absolutely fine uh, for, for, uh, for quite a few people to uh, maybe not lead, take charge or kind of make themselves heard. Uh, they would rather be okay being told or being led, which is absolutely fine. And there is nothing wrong with that at all, uh, because they would be focusing inwards. They would be focusing on their own deliverable and quality of work. Um, Christian, before we move, before we move ahead, um, let me ask you this question in, in a very, uh, how should I say this? So it, it's, it might sound like a very stupid question, uh, but you'll have to tell me um, how do we go about it? So let's assume now, because we know the nature of the tech industry is such that I am going to move from one job to the other. It's quite possible. People probably don't spend the average um, attrition rate in the Indian tech industry is actually higher than the rest of the countries. And uh, we are seeing anywhere between two, two and a half years and not longer than that, which means given your 15 to 20 years of experience that you've spent in India, you must have touched hundreds of developers, um, most of them who are probably not working with you today. Um, so when people jump from one team to the other within, within the company or outside of it, how do you recognize the traits of an empowered team? I, I think one of the key things, or you can tell whether you're working on an empowered team, relates to what you've already mentioned, um, that you don't have to ask for permission to do things. Yeah? 
you already have the permission to do your job. That's what you're getting the paycheck for. That's what you signed <laughs> up for, literally, in yes. your contract. Uh, to do engineering, uh, to do software development. Um, but it, a, a good example, in my opinion, is test-driven development. I, I see people um, and regularly interact with people who say they would actually like to do test-driven development but they are afraid to ask if they're allowed to do so, or they are asking and then the response is not what they expected. Well, one thing is um, you don't have to ask if you're allowed to do the job that you're already asked to do. Yeah? You're, you're asked to deliver software. If you want to do test-driven development, then that's probably or hopefully because you have heard or maybe even already experienced yourself that you can deliver software more smoothly, less uh, with less defects, and um, therefore ultimately also quicker if you're doing test-driven development. So you want to do that. Well, what gets in the way of doing it? Just do it. Absolutely. Yeah? Then do you ask your boss? Um, do you ask your boss if you're allowed to press the enter key? You you don't ask for for that, yeah. Why are you asking your boss if you are allowed to do test driven development? If you if you're allowed to to first express the expectation what you want the software to do before you um, actually realize it? Um, well, why ask for permission to do that? That that should actually be the due diligence yes. of every engineer today. And it's a failure of our education system in engineering that it's not the standard thing to do yet, mm. despite that we know about it. Actually, not just since Kent Beck. He says, I didn't invent it. I just rediscovered it. Um, it was the Mercury program that was at the NASA before the Apollo program to bring the first American astronaut into space. That is the first documented account of a technique that we now in hindsight could call test-driven development. It's not new stuff. Yeah, there also has been a lightweight process movement already in the 60s. Yeah, agile is not new stuff. The label is new. The manifesto was, yes. was new at the time because someone wrote it down again. But it wasn't entirely new ideas. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, the manifesto came out in 2001 and almost over 20 years now. Um, but yeah, it, it's a good reminder that that wasn't the first time when anybody discovered that, hey, we need to keep the customer in loop. Obviously, that was not the first time. The exactly. software had already passed three decades of development and shipping. Um, but, yes. I, but yes, I want to come back to that point of yours. So doing the right thing never needs permission. And uh, and I have I've argued argued with people a lot, uh, saying doing the right thing itself is subjective. Uh, but I've kind of told them that doing the right thing is actually not subjective. That is probably the only thing which is not subjective. And uh, uh, a lot of it comes from the right practices. A lot of it comes from being a good citizen of the ecosystem. Um, and a lot of it actually comes from the fact that you want to uh, build good software. Uh, that will stand the test of time. It's as simple as that, really, and also straightforward. Uh, a lot of it may be driven by uh, common sense, but um, have you encountered a situation where maybe you have found it really hard to align your principles with someone of your peer, maybe not subordinate, but of your peer where you said that, no, it's probably not possible to work with you because our values don't align. Has that ever happened? Yes, that, that does happen, yeah. Empowerment requires psychological safety. If you're not feeling safe, you're not going to have courage. Yeah. If you're not feeling safe, you're easily getting defensive. When you're getting defensive, um, it might or might not depend on the individual and the situation. But there's a risk of hampering another value as well, which is respect. Yeah? Yes. And probably if you're not feeling safe, respect as a value had already been violated towards you or not established towards you. Yeah? So um, 
I think um, the empowerment of teams is closely related to values. I think we're going to get to that more deeply later, right? And um, another aspect about um, asking for permission, um, I want to explain my perspective of what happens from the view of psychology with the disclaimer that I'm not a psychologist and what I might say about this could be utter rubbish. Yeah, so take this with a grain of salt. Oh, please, um, please go ahead, yes. Um, so let, let's say you want to do TDD and you go to your boss and you ask them whether you're allowed to do TDD. Yeah? You're going there with your enthusiasm and you say you want to do it. Yeah, and you just want to be safe and you want to do it. So you, you go to your boss and you expect the response to be yes. But I can tell you the response of the boss will most likely be no. And not because they don't like TDD, but let's put ourselves in the shoes of the boss, of the manager. Very often, the manager is already somewhat disconnected from engineering, especially in India. And that, that's not because Indians are bad at management. No, it's, it's simply a function of the demographics. India is a very, very young country. If the average age of your software engineering team is 26.5, then the one with 29 years is the most experienced person in your team, and that's your candidate for turning into a manager. Yeah. In, in Europe, um, when, when you're, you're 40, you're still an engineer. When you're 50, you're probably still an engineer. Yeah? Engineer is a career in Europe. Yeah? There are people that want to be engineers and want to say engineer until the rest of their life. Yes. And there's, yes. that's okay. Yeah? In India, you have an entirely different situation. The whole country is on a different level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah, their yeah. social status is important. Europe is self-actualization. Yeah. And it's it's why is India lagging behind um colonization? Yeah. The Europeans are even to blame for that. <laughs> so um ju just in to prevent that anyone thinks I'm bad mouthing the Indians. No, I'm just describing the situation that, that is there. And um so what does your boss think in that case? Oh, he's they suggest a process change. Do I understand the process change? Not really. Um, had anyone else suggested this to me? No. Um, the boss now is actually on the back foot and probably says no out of fear. Yeah? <laughs> and it, it doesn't mean that they are a bad manager. They're just mm. a human. Right. Yeah? So you're actually, from a perspective of how I, as a non-psychologist, understand this aspect of psychology, putting your, your boss into a bad situation by asking them whether or not you're allowed to do TDD. If you want to have it rolled out for everyone, if you want to make it a standard, that's a different topic. Yeah? But first start yourself and let the others observe your successes, then some people will come and ask you for help. They want to replicate your success. Yeah? True, and true. then you're in a phase where there will be tension in the team because some people will do it, some people will not do it. You have to go through that. You, you can't flip a switch overnight from non-TDD to DDD. It doesn't work for so many yes. reasons. No, it, it does actually get back a few memories of my own. So I had to make a presentation on cost of quality to my manager and I had to explain him uh, why TDD may be necessary. And the tests may itself then later become the documentation. All the use cases and scenarios are covered in, in the tests. Uh, we all will be at comfort knowing and getting a good night's sleep uh, that even if at the last moment, uh, at the date of the release, even if there is a production bug, we should be able to fix it with enough confidence. So uh, it, it did take a little bit. So obviously, I in my head now that I, when I think back, um, it was, it, it, I obviously had the courage. Um, I was probably already part of the um, empowered team because I did feel safe enough to approach my manager and actually educate on a certain matter, which maybe he may be oblivious to. Um, 
the immediate response that the manager did give me is how much time it's going to take if it's going to cost uh, us a little bit more uh, are the release dates have to will have will they have to be revised but i think that negotiation as the point you had brought up the last time that conversation was much easier to have once the benefit was kind of convinced so once we are on the same page yep so yes, yes. that did happen which, um, but by the way, being on the same page with management or business is very important. Very and important, yes. um, there's one book I recommend to every software engineer to read, which is not a software engineering book. It's the 10 Day MBA by Stephen Silviger. Okay. It's a book about business, and you can read it in 10 days, actually, nine days. The 10th chapter isn't that important. Um, you can read it in nine days, one chapter a day. Um, it talks about marketing, ethics, accounting, operations, finance, and so on. Um, learn more about business because in the end, most of the engineering that we do is for business. Correct. So if you want to tell management or if you want to hand them over information that they should support changing direction, in some way, yeah, then present the information with data they understand. Yeah. Right. And um, number of test cases, test coverage, that, that's completely irrelevant for management. Correct. It's indirect data for them. For you as an engineer, it's direct data, but for them, it's indirect data. For them, number of escape defects. Yes. Hours spent on support, hours spent on debugging, that's opportunity cost. Correct. Yeah? You can, you can also ask your controller, um, if you're working in a larger company, you would probably have a controller and you can ask them what is the hourly rate that is built internally to understand engineering costs, get these numbers, yeah. then um, observe in your team how much time is spent on, um, on debugging, yeah. get those numbers and help management and also yourself to understand the impact. Yeah. You will be surprised. TDD is even more valuable than you probably think <laughs> once you know how much time you spend on debugging True. when you're not doing TDD. Absolutely, absolutely. So yes, Christian. So going back to my original question, let me add a few things to that question. So I was talking mm -hmm. about misalignment of values um, that actually bring empowerment to a particular team. So have we had to yeah. deal with or work with any particular leader where you had to keep your foot down saying, it doesn't look like I can work with you. And uh, how did you handle that conflict maybe of sorts? Yeah. Um, the way how I handled such conflicts has changed over time. I hope that with experience, I have matured over time. Um, the last time I had a conflict about that um, was actually just last year. We have um, disengaged with a client because of a misalignment of values. But um, I think you can do so in a nice way. It doesn't have to, to be fighting. It doesn't have to involve bad-mouthing or anything. Yeah? That's why I'm also not saying that the client is bad. I'm not saying that. I have no reason to say that. All I could see is that the, the values are misaligned. You know? right. I can, can tell the situation that happened. You know? So we had one of our consultants working with that client together on one of their clients' projects. And the consultant was told to install software that will... Um, capture screenshots and track mouse movement and keyboard um, inputs and so on to make sure that everyone on the project is really working, yeah? which is something that doesn't align with our True. values. Yeah. yeah? Um, but but okay, yeah. When you're working with clients, you you will never find someone who is one hundred percent aligned with your values. You Agreed. have yes. to compromise, yeah, and you have to. To, to think of things like um, commitment, yeah, like you, you committed to the client, you committed to the engineer, you also committed that you put the engineer in an um, environment where they can learn and so on. So you are ready to compromise to some extent. Yeah? But now what, what happened, um, that consultant was actually asked to play a more of a leading role and influencing role 
And doing so meant being a lot on chats. Not all chats happened on the computer. Some of them happened on WhatsApp. Um, and um, also make decisions. And that involves thinking. Yeah, Engineering is actually much more thinking than typing. And if you try to measure productivity yes. by typing, you're definitely measuring the wrong thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and if, if you if you measure busyness, yeah, how do you measure that? Sometimes you have to go for a walk or stand below a tree or or smell a flower or whatever it is, what keep, gets your brain going and unclogs your brain in order to have your your creative spirits flow and get the ideas to solve problems in better ways. Yeah, That's part True. of our job. True. Yeah? You True. can't always get that on the keyboard. Yeah? So many ideas happen when you walk to the water um, cooler or the coffee machine. Um, in, I'm not promoting smoking, but in the 80s and 90s, before the smoking laws were introduced, the most well-informed people in companies typically used to be the smokers. Yes, yeah. <laughs> because they would be meeting outside and then smoke yes. cigarettes together and yeah. while they exchange information. Yeah. Um, obviously, not promoting smoking, but um, think of the social aspects of information inter um, exchange in an organization. Yeah, but um, so. Yeah, so you did actually touch upon all the five Scrum values and just yeah. for uh, compiling it, let me just kind of just go over the five values which maybe empower teams practices practice it much better than the rest. Uh, we spoke of commitment, you gave three examples of commitment of how committed you are and how commitment can be measured. Courage is of course, we spoke about being uh, having the psychological safety to uh, to be, uh, to say the right thing, do the right thing, uh, focus, of course. So I have, I've understood that in software, uh, and especially when it comes to agile as a terminology, uh, people misconstrue focus a lot. Uh, focus, of course, is, uh, is to get more done probably in the same amount of time, but focus is also on your end goal and uh, where you're headed. Uh, people stay so when they when we talk of agility, people actually think that changing requirements at the last moment is okay, um, and and they feel that okay, changing the shifting the goalpost would probably be fine, and that actually destroys focus more than anything else. Um, focus also brings in alignment a lot. Uh, before I talk about openness and respect, the rest of the two values, uh, Christian, would you like to say something about focus? Um. Yeah, for me, it's actually not a value. Yeah, And um, I personally actually prefer the XP values over the Scrum values. They are similar, not the same. Yeah, The XP values, communication, courage, feedback, respect, and simplicity. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think focus is important. Focus um, means different things to different people. Focus brings excellence. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of any path that leads to excellence that would be unfocused. Can't, so can't imagine that. Yeah, no, not claiming I've done the logic on that. Yeah, um, maybe there is. I just can't see it. So I, I think focus is important. Um, openness is important. Yeah, be open to new ideas, be open to new ways of working. Respect is very important. Yeah. Um, Openness without respect can be very destructive. Yeah, um, that's something where I, I think a lot of agilists, maybe occasionally even myself, have been wrong by walking around and telling people you have to do things differently. Um, not necessarily always understanding that their present way of working has um, evolved for reasons you know? and not um, respecting that they might have been in a very different situation some time ago and that they've already gone a long way to reach to the point where they are right now. You know? sure. I think uh, agile coaching is important to um, help organizations and teams and individuals to 
remain focused on their values, also to first find out what their values actually should be. Yeah, It doesn't have to be the Scrum values. It doesn't have to be the XP values. The values should be aligned to what you have as your vision and what you have as your goals in order to achieve these visions. The values have to align with that. Yeah, what we try in XP and in Scrum with value sets is we, we try to come up with value sets that are very generic, that would be a one size fits all. Yeah. yeah. And obviously there is no such thing as a one Better. size fits all. Yeah. <laughs> um, depending yeah. on what product you're building, you will have to have a different value set. You should have a different value set. Yeah? If you're or and or you might have the same value set, but you might have to have a very different understanding of what courage means. Let's say you build a security relevant product or a safety relevant product. What courage means is something entirely different um, in, in that space than if you're building an online shop. I also like the XP value of simplicity. Mm because it keeps craft, it keeps waste out of the system. I am not aware of whether the XP folks were already aware of the lean principles at the time they created that's, XP. Yeah, that's where Probably it may have come not. from. Yeah. Yeah. Yet yeah. it aligns with lean. Simplicity totally, in my opinion, targets True. towards lean principles. Correct. Um, and feedback is is a value I, I know why scrum doesn't have it as a value because in scrum it's a mantra it's back and adapt that's yeah. um another word for feedback right. um it's re it's reminding us that feedback doesn't only mean obtain information it also means to act upon it that's what true. adapt means yes yeah so yeah feedback so, I mean, is there in scrum. true feedback i think it would come from openness also because i've I mean, so when you actually put this to practice more than on the theory, uh, I often tell my people that it's okay, let's argue. I mean, I'm absolutely have, okay having heated conversations uh, inside yes. or outside of the con uh, conference room. That does not matter. But that at least shows me that you care enough. Uh, because the, the only thing which I cannot probably stand is indifference. So don't tell me that you don't care. If you care, you will obviously disagree with me. You will maybe agree and then even also propose me a few good things. Uh, because disagreement will actually lead to something more uh, uh, fruitful, something more productive. And that is also the way to innovation, because there is absolutely no way I see things, perspectives are different. The way people will solution things, they, that will be different. And if we don't converse, if we don't argue, if we don't debate, um, these things are not going to happen. So yeah, um, I would rather take a heated conversation any day than indifference. So yeah, so I, I think openness would probably amount for that. And of course, respect. So in the not, not so long time ago, I believe people always said respect has to be earned, uh, which usually comes from demonstration. Uh, but I do feel that it is a two-way street. It has always been a two-way street. So you offer what you get back and sometimes uh, a lot more in return than what you give. So respect, um, I believe for every skill, for every potential, for every being um, is probably the crux or foundation of any relationship, um, be, it, um, be it your own peer or subordinate or your supervisor or your uh, immediate senior or your customers, your users, your clients and everyone really. Um, is there anything would you like to add on? Yes, I actually don't agree with this statement, respect has to be earned. Yeah. Um, there, there are some good intentions behind that statement, but I'm, I'm, what does respect mean? Literally, it means looking back. That, that means looking out for the other person and making sure that you're not accidentally, um, and we, we, we hopefully never speak of intentionally, um, do something that go and um, may, makes the other person bad or uncomfortable or anything like that. Um, respect doesn't have to be earned. Respect should be the basis of all our interactions. Absolutely, you know? yes. And um, I think it's admiration that people can earn. Yeah, you know? and we have to be careful with that. Yeah, you know? never meet your heroes. You'll usually be disappointed. <laughs> you know? Um. And um, well, pe people can lose respect, you know? mm -hmm. but I, and then they might have to re-earn it. 
Yes. Yeah, if, um, if you bad mouth me for no reason, um, then I will lose respect for you. Correct. Yeah? Then you will have to work to, to re-earn the respect. But um, the respect, if we put a scale on it, um, the, the respect we should be giving to other people that we don't know shouldn't be zero. Yeah. <laughs> it should definitely yeah. not be zero. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I think it should I come am... on. It should come on as a default setting, and then you kind of attune yourself over time. Um, if there's a person behind me, um, when I'm in a, in a swinging door, I, I should hold the door open, irrespectively of who that is and um, whether right. or not I know that person. That is a, a matter of respect and courtesy. Correct. You know? Yes. So that the door doesn't fly in their face. They don't have to earn that. It, it's part of normal human decency to to be respectful <laughs> towards us. So true, so true. Something as basic and f- fundamental as that. When we spoke about some values, we spoke about XP values, um, but somewhere, and then you also mentioned that uh, people need to be coached on agile and these most of these principles also on how to being or function as a team together, um, which means that a lot of weightage or a lot of importance should be given on personal traits as well. People are not born equal, equal as in their own personal traits per se. Some skills, of, of course, have to be acquired. Um, uh, people may not be born to be work, working in a team. They may be uh, doing their best working in a silo or maybe just kind of alone by themselves. Um, so when it comes to personal traits, um, you feel um, motivation, which is an exterior factor, really. Uh, so there are, there are two, two ways to go about it, right? People can, there is intrinsic motivation, which actually comes and fuels sense of satisfaction. And then there is exterior motivation, which comes in form of rewards and recognition of sorts. Um, uh, is there a way to kind of compensate that? Uh, you already mentioned that appreciation is one. Any thoughts on that? One thing is um, there are fields like psychology and um, that has individual psychology and organizational psychology. Most agile coaches, me included, are not professional, educated and trained in psychology. And therefore, in my opinion, should be threading very, very carefully when we touch that field, yeah, you, you can't avoid touching it because all human interaction has psychology involved. That's what psychology is about. Yeah. Yes. Um, for example, what I said about um, face-to-face communication, when people started to use it as an argument to, um, to work in office, yeah, and that, um, it's much more about the co-location of minds than it is about the co-location of bodies. <laughs> True. In order to share ideas, we need our minds to touch each other. And this obviously involves psychology. And it's psychology should be a subject that everyone should be taught in school. That's how I think how important it is. We are not. yeah. And then once we're adults, it's also a matter of do we give enough time to that topic by, by reading books? Yeah. And then also, are we still humble enough to understand that just reading one or two books about psychology doesn't make you an expert compared to someone who studied it for four <laughs> five years? Um, yeah, Dunning-Kruger effect. Yes. Yeah? Be very careful um, about um, not um, overestimating your abilities. And um, I, I think this year might actually bring a bad... Um, awakening for a lot of agile coaches when organizations find out that when you're an agile coach and you try to meddle with organizational psychology and you're not trained in organizational psychology that you're not having as much value as a psychologist who is trained in organizational psychology yes so true and when you um when you're also not a full band with agile coach and you just wrote the bandwagon of, of saying okay after a two days from the course <laughs> and a certificate i can now sell myself expensively to organizations and tell them what to do yeah you will have a bad awakening because the tech coach is um is carving your your presence from the other yeah. direction yeah i think 
this year is going to be a bad awakening for a lot of coaches. Good coaches will stay, but this, it's an opportunity to weed out. Yeah? For me, being agile means being marked with ready ability to move with quick, easy grace. Mm. That has context. A cheetah is agile. A ballet dancer is agile. Yeah, Are they agile in the same way? No. Yeah. <laughs> they're agile in different ways. Yeah. They are agile in their contexts. Mm. Are they agile in everything? No. Ask the cheetah to read a book and they're totally non agile <laughs> about it. <laughs> um, it has to do with context and with abilities. Yeah. You can't obtain agility without practice. Yeah. How do you make something look easy? Yeah. Look, look at a ballet dancer, it looks so easy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, we, yeah. And we know it's it's to some extent easy for them. Yeah? True. But, well, how does it become so easy for them that they can perform a flawless performance? Because they're professionals. They right. didn't practice until they got it right. They practiced until they can no longer get it wrong. Correct. Oh, wow. Yeah, I love that. So, yes. So, um, Christian, so I, I'm going to... I'm going to tell a tell a short story, okay, on this and uh, this this whole part about motivation, right? I I've, I have conversations. I engage with a lot of people outside of my work circle and social circles as well, and I keep telling people that people are extraordinarily nice to each other inside the office. So there is something, there is like a paradigm shift in how a person behaves inside the office and outside of it. Uh, and I don't understand why. And I've seen this more so often in India than in other countries. Uh, but I have seen this for sure. And I can tell you that you're open to learning, you're open to absorbing new things inside the office comes very naturally to people. The moment you step outside of the office, you become from the citizen of the organization, you become the citizen of the country, let's say you're on the road, and there somebody's trying to tell you the right thing, people are suddenly closed. And they would they would argue, they would have illogical arguments. I think just being nice to each other without any incentive is missing grossly in, in our today's cultures. And um, every time we have these leadership discussions, uh, it does borderline on psychology and philosophy. So, because that is what leadership is all about. Ultimately, it is about working with people and getting the best out of them to do the best work that they can bring to the table. I want to move to the next point out here, which is sense of urgency, uh, which, is, which is generally relative. Everybody has, has, has their own prioritization engine, so to say, within themselves. And they kind of understand that moving beyond business priorities, where you're told what you should be working on first uh, before the other, they also have their own sense of urgency running within themselves. I think that goes very much into the realm of continuous improvement. True. Why do I think so? The sense of urgency is very often caused by burning fires. Burning fires need firefighters. But organizations that reward firefighting are at the risk of inadvertently breeding arsonists. Root cause analysis is important. Yeah. Defect prevention is better than defect detection. True. Yeah. It, it's difficult because prevented defects don't make noise. There are no ripples from prevented defects. We don't see them. They are completely silent. We yeah. only see the unprevented defects. Yeah. Yet that is what I think distinguishes excellent, great leadership from just good leadership to be cognizant of that and to reward those realms where problems don't come from yeah? and give them recognition, yeah? something like, the third quarter in a row, we had zero defects in that service. Congratulations. Yes. Yes, Something like that. Yeah. And not 
for the third quarter of the row, this team has done five night shifts to deal with defects. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's not great. Yeah, right. it it makes people feel great temporarily, and we we feel that yeah they they are going an extra mile, but this extra mile is already a failure. The necessity of having to go that extra mile is a failure. It shouldn't be. It should be completely fine to do a nine to five job. Yeah. And whatever you do outside of nine to five extra, it shouldn't be firefighting. It should be other things. Yeah. It should be continuous improvement. Yeah. But 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 not firefighting. And if you don't tackle that, the continuous sense of urgency will drown your ability to continuously improve mm. and understand that yes we are interested in outcomes but we will not produce outcomes if we are not cognizant of the process the principles and practices and the way of working that we apply in order to produce outcomes so this actually question i'm going to push this point ahead a little into authority. Um, do you think authority plays a very important role? Uh, so obviously, authority can be used to empower your own team. Um, but in most cases, because the sense of authority uh, is generally hard to deal with, that's why you have leadership coaching in several organizations. So does authority interject with a lot of sense of freedom or inhibition that can be cultivated in the team? I have my problems with authority. Okay. Um, I have my problems with politicians, and I don't think there's a politician I don't have a problem with. <laughs> um, and um, I, one, I only was employed once in my life for for nine years, and I went back to being an entrepreneur. And I'd rather live on the road than being employed again because I think I have a problem with authority, yeah? and. For me, the best times at work during employment were the times when I didn't see my boss. And that's not because I had bad bosses. Yeah, mm -hmm. Actually, um, the, the bosses I had in Munich when I was employed were excellent people. They were really great. That's a flaw of myself, I think, yeah? that I have a problem with authority. Yeah? That's why I'm... I, I'm not sure when I can give good answers to that. Yeah. <laughs> How are you me, as a leader? That may be a good way to answer that question. Um, I actually don't really like to lead either. Yeah. Okay. I'm this this problem of authority goes in both directions. I want right. people to do the right thing. Yeah. Correct. But I don't want people to do things because I told them to. Awesome. Yeah? Yes. And that's that's not why I want people to do things. Yeah. Nice. I want people to share visions. I want people to, to be in, in emotionally invested in the vision, being held hostage emotionally. Yeah, that's <laughs> abuse. No, that's not yes. what I mean. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want people to say, yeah, this is a great vision. Um, I, I want to work on this because I believe in this vision. Yeah. That that should be part of their motivation. And I want people to, to do things because they are convinced that those are the right things to do and not because I or anybody else told them this is how you have to do it. Yeah? Now, there, there can be situations where um, you have to learn by doing and where therefore you want someone to do something temporarily just for the sake that you're telling them, asking them to trust you as a leader or, or trainer or teacher in that case, that it is for a reason. Yeah. And then make, make sure that feedback loop is there so that they, they get that feedback that that was the reason mm -hmm. and that they also understand the moment when the expectation, do it because I'm saying it, is gone because it can be a permanent state. Yeah, that there can be a short period during teaching, yeah, and it has nothing to do with software engineering. It's just with, with teaching. Sometimes, <laughs> um, for example, if you're learning snowboarding, yeah, you sometimes you just really have to follow the instructions of the teacher and put <laughs> the weight on the left foot backside <laughs> and just listen to them. 
because otherwise you're gonna fall on your nose again. Exactly. <laughs> so true. And then, yes. then only once you feel what it means if you do that, you, you're scared doing that. But then if you do that, you lose the scare of doing that because you feel it actually works better than what you've done before. And then you understand why the teacher was telling you. Yeah, but sure. this understanding can sometimes go to the um, cognitive part of the brain. It sometimes has to go through other sensory parts. Yeah, in this case, the sense of balance, for example. Correct. Yeah? Correct. All right. Christian, we have towards the tapering end of our conversation. So I kind of wanted to touch base on two topics. One is, of course, the anti-patterns, because while we are talking about the right things to do and how to go about the values and cultivating or empowering teams, uh, there are, of course, anti-patterns everywhere. And of course, this also does have its own set of anti-patterns. The second thing that I want to definitely talk about is how does it look at the apex of maturity? How do mature teams function? Um, because I do believe that I have had the opportunity and the privilege of working with few such teams and um, I, I have never had to measure productivity. Never, 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 ever. Uh, I've, uh, I've had uh, project plans, but they were mostly uh, run by the whole team. So we will talk about that also a little bit. But coming back to anti-patterns, um, the most common one that I always feel is accountability. Uh, the moment we sh we say that accountability is shared, it suddenly becomes nobody's accountability. And uh, uh, this whole concept of shared accountability and getting things done as a team, how easy or hard is it to get it done? You can't be accountable for something for which you're not empowered. How should right. that work? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think it relates closely to empowerment. But when I when I think back at my time um, when I was employed, I regularly observed um, managers slightly overloading people. Slightly. That's very mm. important. Slightly. With a good intention in order to, to make them grow. Yeah. And I told them. I'm slightly giving you more than I think you can have on your plate. This is an opportunity for you to grow. Yeah. Let's see if you manage that. If not, it's going to be fine. Yeah? Right. And what you do as a manager in order to do this responsibly is you have to observe your employee that they don't do too many over hours. You have to observe that they especially don't do secret over hours. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, so that, that people don't burn out from that. Yeah, you don't want to push people people to burn out. You want to give them opportunities to growth. Yeah, then yeah. the, the nudge can be the same nudge, and they can be different results. So you have to be very observant as a leader about that. Um, and you have to be careful about priorities in, in, in terms of making sure that whatever doesn't get done really was the least important thing. That they had on their plate yeah? mm -hmm. and then also sometimes you have to accept that priorities change and um, also um, priorities um, can be perceived differently by different people yeah? and then if, if you're a line manager you typically are not the only person managing another person um, you often have a project manager besides you yeah and then the title project manager might be um, different or even split in other organizations. Yeah, For me, product owner and scrum master are two coins, the two sides of the coin project management. Yeah, One is about process, the other is about product right. in, in a sense. Yeah? Um, and the, these people are effectively also in a managerial role. And I don't agree with the, the scrum alliance in its teachings always say that the scrum master is not a manager. Just by repeatedly saying that doesn't make it an doesn't organizational it. truth. <laughs> yeah. um, an organizational truth is that often the Scrum Master also is a manager. Manager, yeah. yes. Um, j just because you, you tell you should have product owners and you should have Scrum Masters doesn't mean that the organization suddenly can double their budget for administrative staff. True. Not how it works. Yes. Yeah. So I've seen a lot of organizations turning line managers 
and project managers into scrum masters and product owners. Product owners, yeah. And giving them the responsibilities of scrum without removing the responsibilities they previously had. Scrum doesn't have a solution for that. Yeah. No. Maybe it doesn't want to, maybe it doesn't need to. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that's why it's so important to see that Scrum is not the goal. Yeah. Scrum is it's a, the means is, to the goal. It's a yeah. means to an end. Scrum doesn't work for everyone. And even if it works for you, once you're you're solid on Scrum, look for the next thing. Yes, so true. So true on that. So there's one more anti-pattern, which is also my personal favorite, is um so we coach people coach people to have willingness and be open to change right uh, reduce the resistance so you know that you can reflect upon you can do a retrospective and reflect upon what did not go well so try and change something um, and that's how innovation will come and the other podcast that i was talking to vishal about he said something similar that even if things are working right doesn't does not mean that uh, you cannot be at the peak of your innovation. You can still try to change what is working and see if it can be better because you don't know what you don't know. So uh, that is also an interesting perspective at it. But while we actually coach people to accept change, um, I do feel that it does get exploited uh, way too often. So uh, because when, when, it, when we talk about slow is smooth is fast uh, and when we keep on changing things without giving it enough time to prove itself um, the essence of change management is lost um, that is this is one of my favorite anti-patterns where i've seen our teams actually functioning with this saying okay okay for two weeks we did this next two weeks we tried something else next two weeks i'm like okay hold on and uh, yeah what do you think about this well first of all i don't believe in retrospectives anymore no? i have changed my view on retrospectives mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't think that retrospection is the problem. I think the retrospective as an event is the problem. Now, let me be clear about that. Um, retrospection just means feedback. Yeah? Yeah. And regular feedback is great. Yeah? But why do you have to wait until the retrospective with exactly. suggesting an improvement to your process? Not only does it make the organization or the team potentially lose momentum in improvement instead of gaining momentum, it also is, uh, is actually going against empowerment. Are you not empowered to improve during the sprint? Yeah. Why do you have to wait for the retrospective? I mean, in defense of Scrum, I have to say the Scrum guide explicitly mentions that in the retrospective, you should inspect what you improve or try to improve and how that worked out. Correct. The Scrum Guide doesn't say you have to wait with your improvement suggestions until the retrospective. It's just how it's played out very often. In Correct. Teams, yeah? Yeah. It is not the fault of the Scrum Guide. Yeah? The Scrum Guide is very clear and correct in this place. Um, but then also, um, what makes really empowered teams or individuals become so high performing. They have ideas and ideas last forever. And they have inspiration, but inspiration is like milk or cheese. It has an expiry date. Yeah? That's not from me, that's from David Heinemeyer Hansen. Yeah? He pre um, wrote this in a blog article like three weeks ago mm -hmm. or so. Mm -hmm. And I really love this because where when you have an idea, in the moment you have that idea, you usually feel inspired about doing it. Yeah? If you don't act upon your inspiration, you lose your inspiration. And with every little bit you lost in your inspiration, the effort in energy and time to create to turn your idea into reality grows exponentially more expensive. Just yeah. Inspiration yeah. is fuel for turning ideas into reality. Nice. Yes. And if you have something like a retrospective that you have to wait for until you voice your idea, what does this, this do to your inspiration? True. Yeah. <laughs> Don't a, let your inspiration fail. Yes. 
Act upon your inspiration right away then and there. Really great products are not just built upon the things. Um, let, let me actually quote myself. Yeah, Good DJs play the music you wanted to hear. Great DJs oh, yes. play the music that you didn't know you wanted to hear. True. Same with products. Good products are what the users wanted. Yeah. Great products are what the users didn't even know they want or need. Yes. Yeah. And this difference is built on inspiration, on ingenuity and creativity. Yeah. If you're feeling inspired to do something, yeah, on, on your product, then go ahead and do it. And that's why one of the many, many reasons why it's so detrimental to load teams to 100% utilization and to have a work in progress that is as big or even bigger than the number of team members and so on. All these things mean that beyond the regular work, there already isn't enough bandwidth for the urgency of firefighting, mm. which means there is not enough bandwidth for fire prevention and we're not even talking about those things that make inspired products they come from the extra bandwidth true awesome awesome thank you for that Tristan. actually that was extremely valuable and yes i did read those i mean so you quoted yourself but i did read that on linkedin yeah. as well so nice that was that is so accurate all right, Christian. So I wanted to conclude the, this podcast talking about the apex of maturity. And I, because you have actually chosen India as your home now, you have worked with a lot of Indian developers, engineers. Uh, you have already seen the new breed of engineers who, which is coming through. Uh, you've also seen the new breed of leaders that are getting cultivated. I wanted you to give your advice or your opinion and make it as direct as possible. That's absolutely fine. Um, at the apex of maturity, if people want to walk this journey and uh, become a part of that particular team, uh, what would your advice be to them? Less job hopping, yeah. less attrition. <laughs> yes. um, stay longer in one place. Yeah. Changing your environment is a very cheap and destructive way of growing. It may sometimes be necessary. Yeah. I'm not saying never switch jobs. Yeah. Sure. But um, sometimes you really have to stay on a product for many years in order to understand it, in yeah. order to understand what makes a difference. Yeah? When I good. took up my, my only employment job in 2005, I was put into memory management. That means we had heap, garbage collection, market sweep algorithm, transaction system, um, object management, and so on. Yeah? That was the, the, one of the most central components of um, the smart and SIM card. At that time, the much of the component was being rewritten. Um, we rewrote the transaction system again and again. And um, the, the rewrite at that time was like about five engineers rewriting it for more than half a year. And I rewrote the transaction system again in 2012, seven years later. And it took me two weeks to rewrite it. <laughs> I'm not saying I turned genius. No, I, I don't think that I'm really um, above average. I don't want to believe that of myself. I give credit to the others. But what happened there is staying so long in that Right. Um, a domain gave me the expertise of understanding what works well and what doesn't work well. Yeah? Right. Um, most of the engineering we do today is standing on the shoulders of giants. Yeah? We use tools. It, it starts with the kernel, Linux. Right. Yeah? Then you have your um, shell layer around Linux, yeah? right. GNU or right. Alpine or BusyBox or whatever. Then um, you run your um, 
your runtime environment, yeah, Java virtual machine or the, the Go runtime or the, the uh, Rust runtime, or whatever it is in your case. Yeah? And in that runtime, you have the runtime library. Mm. And then you have all the third party libraries mm. going into that. Yeah? And um, that stuff together is many millions lines of code that you reuse. Right. And then um, you're building something that has like 20, 30, 40,000 lines on, on top of that. Yeah? It's really great that um, we have all these libraries and tools and runtime environments available in order to build products so fast. Yeah? But um, if you really want to make a difference, yeah, don't just use this ecosystem, but contribute to this ecosystem. Yes. And we we learned over the years that this ecosystem should be open source. Yeah? Yeah. Like 99% of the ecosystem now is open source. The kernel is open source. GNU yeah. is open source. Um, the JVM is open source. Um, the libraries, yeah, what you use, Spring, Apache, it's all open source. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to make a difference, learn contributing to that as well. Yeah, people will remember Ryan Kern again. Yeah? Sadly, he's not as popular as um, as Steve Jobs, yeah? which I think um, says a lot about the culture of present day. And in my opinion, it doesn't say good things mm. about the culture of present day, that I people know more is. about Steve Jobs than they know about Brian Kernighan or Dennis Ritchie or Ken Thompson yeah. or Donald Knuth. Yeah. Um, that's, um, that's, I think, detrimental for our engineering discipline. Yeah. And I think um, be more scientific in your approach. Yeah. That's another thing I think people can improve. And um, ooh, things specifically to, to India, um, you, you mentioned before that at the workplace, you experience people are typically so nice when you go out on the road and people seem to change. Um, I'm not sure whether that is the case in every country. No. I am very certain that there's one country where that is not the case. That's a country that in many, many other aspects is very, very similar to India. That is Nepal. Mm. Yeah. Um, go to Nepal and observe the people. Observe the traffic. Now, observe when you're on the main road in Kathmandu or on the ring road in Kathmandu, how people resolve traffic situations. Awesome. There is much less honking. There's much more courtesy. <laughs> There's the same density of vehicles per square meters, yet traffic flows better because nice. of that. Nice. Yeah. Thank you so much, Christian. I think that adds so much value. I mean, I know we spoke at uh, a little bit higher level than uh, engineers would probably like, but I think that's where it probably it begins. So maturity comes from over a period of time doing the same thing over and over again. Um, and of course, being cognizant about what is working and what is not working and adapting to uh, working together. Thank you so much for this. Thank you for joining me here. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye, Chris. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.